the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Now, this Gospel today is the first real opportunity we've had this Advent to consider what we're actually preparing for. I mean, this is partly by happenstance. Last week, Father Stalin talked about the work of the MI, and the week before that, the Gospel is about the end of the world <laughs> and the second coming of Christ. But the theme of today's Mass is very definitely one of rejoicing. And the reason why we rejoice is the approaching feast of Christmas. So the introit starts with the word rejoice, gaudete, and it quotes the epistle, actually, which similarly starts with that word. So although we have got three ember days coming up this week, and more or less another full week of Advent after that, um, we're still, uh, we're already starting to feel the Christmas joy. I say Christmas joy. I don't know how many of you people, or you watching at home, are telly watchers, but you know, you might think there's not much cause for joy in the dystopian Scotland of 2021. But the figures came out from Public Health Scotland on Wednesday, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. Uh, the latest figures, which in fact are cumulative from, ooh, middle of August, I think 14th of August they start and they go on uh, right up until the end of November. So they show, <laughs> what do they show? They show the number of cases, the number of hospitalizations, and the number of deaths from the COVID. Now, of course, this data is seriously flawed because the premise for everything is, in fact, the PCR test. Um, and as the inventor of the PCR test himself said, um, it's not at all a suitable tool for detecting viral activity, much less diagnosing a particular strain of a particular virus. It can't do that. It's not designed for that. It, it simply cannot do it. That's, <laughs> particularly when you're amplifying cycles, anything above 25, I think, is really worthless. So it seems to me to be completely arbitrary. I mean, these tests might be picking up uh, the normal colds and flu with which you've all been afflicted over the last few weeks, November and uh, December in Scotland. Uh, you know, it's not unknown for people to get a cold. Um, but it might be completely by chance, whether you get a positive test or a negative test. My curious, bless him, was forbidden to travel because he got a positive test. So he took another one 40 minutes later and it was negative. So he went. It's, that's, that's how it works. That's the science. That's the science that I want you all to follow. Yeah. Well, anyway, this, this report came and it's very interesting. You can look at it online. Um, it's full of little graphs and they show the cumulative data over the last four months and show, in fact, that whatever the government has done, whether it's imposing masks or jagging arms, even restricting access to certain venues based on whether you've been jagged or not, you might call that medical apartheid. Um, it's not working. None of it is working. It's making not a rap of difference. Uh, if you look actually at the cases, because they were very helpful this time in putting across the number of cases of jagged and unjagged. And you can see in the tables what the figures are. So 58% of the cases, 58%, that's more than half of the cases are jagged. 71% of the hospitalizations are jagged. 85% of the 
of the COVID deaths I jagged. Now that's, <laughs> this is not conspiracy theory stuff. This is the stuff that the PHS is putting out. This is Public Health Scotland. These are the official figures. So it doesn't matter, you can watch Dr. Hillary, if you like, in the morning, saying, yes, nine out of 10 of the people who die have not been jagged. It's simply not true. The official figures show you it's not true. It's lies. Or perhaps he's making a mistake. Perhaps he isn't really a doctor. Perhaps he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's a bit of a TV star. But it's simply not true. These things are not true. I remember I was speaking about this last year. I was looking through the sermon last year. I thought we don't want to say the same sort of things. But last year, this hadn't come in yet. They were already promising it would come in. You'd be able to get your jag and you would have a 95% less chance of dying from the COVID. And now it turns out from Public Health Scotland after a year, <laughs> you've got a 407% more greater chance of dying from the COVID if you've been jagged. It doesn't make any sense. And, and the government is using these figures, these very figures, to consider still whether to ban Christmas or not. Well, I don't know if it's deliberate, but it does seem to me, at least, that these people are trying to wear us down. Lies, distortions, fear-mongering, and that in a constant barrage. What do we think about that? Well, I mean, what I was thinking about, what does St. John say in the Gospel today? He quotes the prophet Isaiah. I thought, oh, let's have a look at the prophet Isaiah and see what he says. Well, he says uh, to the people, be of good heart. He doesn't quite say rejoice, but he does say, be of good heart. Christ is coming. Christ is the motive for our courage and our hope. I'm convinced this is why, of course, the, the church puts before us in Advent the figure of St. John the Baptist in these last three Sundays. And particularly today, we see the most important quality that he had. And I would put it to you today that that is self-knowledge. The scribes and the Pharisees try and find out who he is. And they impute to him various titles, the prophet, um, Elijah, or even Christ himself. No, he says, I'm not any of those. I am the voice who announces the word. That is all. And this self-knowledge is vital because it makes him brave, it makes him courageous, and it makes him fearless. And uh, <laughs> the opposite of all these things is pusillanimity. Pusillanimity. Um, <laughs> what do you know? In his definition of pusillanimity, Aristotle says the pusillanim pusillanimous man is one who does not know himself. And then he goes on to say, otherwise he would desire and strive for those things which he deserves. Such a man lacks confidence in his own strength and exaggerates the difficulties he has to face through his natural pessimistic temperament, at times through laziness. Any obstacle seems to him to be a mountain. Knowledge acquired by others, like himself, seems to him to be unattainable. The simplest tasks are, in his eyes, very complicated ones. Because of his lack of self-esteem and exaggeration of difficulties, he never undertakes great works nor does he aspire to things worthy of a real man. What is more, if life became really difficult for him, 
he would die rather than make an effort to overcome the situation. Thus spake Aristotle. Now look, Aristotle's a pagan, and obviously if we take his words as he says them, and as he meant them as a pagan, you know, we're going to be falling into pride uh, or Pelagianism. So you have to be very careful. And I thought, well, it's a very good definition, and it is very, very comprehensive of what's at the root of it, lack of sync knowledge, and uh, the sort of things that it leads to, and the sort of, sort of things that you will never do if you're like that. But if you look at St. Thomas, who takes Aristotle and uh, gives it a Catholic interpretation, he actually applies these principles to our Christian life, to our Catholic life. Uh, and its end, which is the attainment of perfection, and thereby salvation. I don't know if it's particularly in our day uh, that we see so many pusillanimous Catholics. Certainly the constant stream of negative news, three weather, short days and so on don't help, but we mustn't be pusillanimous. The task before us is indeed great. Be ye perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. How many Catholics spend their days aiming at, <laughs> in a desultory manner, aiming at purgatory as an ideal? That's what they're aiming for. That is incredible. It's got pusillanimity written all over it. Oh, I'd just like to scrape my way into purgatory. Oh, no, no. Perfection seems to them a goal which they can never attain. It's for people far above them, not for themselves. The obstacles to attaining it are presented as invincible. And what are the obstacles? <laughs> the obstacles are you've got to control your passions and you've got to acquire virtues, which is difficult. Our pusillanimous man sees this and sees in himself only his own weakness and laziness, which produce in him a state of cowardice and even depression, which St. Thomas says, is very like laziness. He is like the man who only received one talent, and what does he do? He buries it in the ground so as not to lose it. So what does St. John say? <laughs> what does his life, and yes, his death, say to us? Well, he says we must be like our Heavenly Father, and that sounds <laughs> a tall order. But Christ has made you his adoptive sons. You are the branches of the true vine. And you can produce divine fruits. It is no longer you who live, but Christ lives in you. Your nature has been lived by Christ and now God wishes to live that nature in you. Can you not see? Can you not see this? This is what being a Catholic is all about. It's not about strength of will or abundance of natural qualities, in which case, I would imagine, uh, very few have the wherewithal to make it. Our human nature, with its weakness, has been grafted on to the true vine, which is Christ. By our baptism, we have entered the divine family by adoption. There should be some familial resemblance. We are the sons of God. We should be like our Heavenly Father. 
That's just a consequence of baptism. He's not asking us to do something that's completely outside our abilities. We have been given everything necessary to do it been grafted onto the true vine, we've been made the sons of God. So you need to dominate the passion as well. <laughs> Dominating the passions is quite difficult. You go over to the west of Scotland, see if they dominate their passions. Well, dominating the passions alone by human power is difficult. But what about grace? <laughs> We've all been given grace. The devil himself trembles at the name of Christ and you have grace. You have this great gift which Christ has given you. Now the devil doesn't want your salvation but it's not up to him. You're fighting against powers and principalities of vastly superior abilities to you but you have something that he doesn't have. What are you going to do with all the graces that God gives you? Pretend they don't exist? Bury them in the ground? What are you frightened of? As I say, the climate of fear in which we now live uh, has made many people lazy and depressed. You know, I remember, this is a curious thing, I remember when I was a wee laddie and the Prime Minister was Harold Wilson and he was doing one of these TV interviews and being asked about, you know, don't you think these policies will make things really difficult for people and, 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 and it'll be it really... Uh, and they asked him these questions, not, not like they do now, it was very soft uh, and, and generous, really. Um, like, not like, you know, they would interview Prime Ministers 20 years later, no. But um, they asked to him uh, all these things, and he said, this is an arrant socialist. Socialists are just sort of baby communists. They're on the way to communism. So he said, all the British people want is a quiet life. What does that imply for him? All the British people want is a quiet life. Well, I suppose what it implies is that whatever unjust governments do to their populations, the people will go along with it for a quiet life. Masks, even on children, even on children, Sticking masks on people. Uh, not letting people go to certain places. Not letting people meet their family. Even if they are dying because of some random test. This is wicked and cruel. And what do the people do? They just want a quiet life. Some of them might go on the box and say, oh, it was really hard not being able to say goodbye to me mum because of a PCR test. This is wickedness on a vast scale. And the people just want to quiet like, he was right. I think he was right, uh, Harold. I mean, soon it's going to be you won't be able to socialise at Christmas. Whatever it is, the pusillanimous will go along with it. But surely, if it is your own weakness, or even loneliness in the struggle against the present tyranny, or for salvation, whichever it is that makes you a coward, <laughs> we have to remember, as Catholics, that Christ has raised us up to the divine level. And we are not alone. Christ dwells in us. We have the presence of the Holy Ghost in our soul if we're in a state of grace. We have the presence of Christ, the true presence of Christ, every time we receive Holy Communion.
We're not alone. It doesn't really matter which path of virtue you choose to take. You will find Christ going ahead of you to give you an example. There is a tremendous strength in the grace of Christ. The eyes of the blind have been opened so that we can see the light of truth, the vanity of this world, and the greatness of God. The ears of the deaf have been opened so that we can hear the call of Christ. We mustn't let ourselves be paralysed by fear. Fear of the Omicron. Fear of uh, the enforcement of unjust laws. Air quotes. Fears of what others say or do to us in the supermarket or on the bus. We certainly shouldn't be fearful of striving for our salvation with our highest ideal being somehow to scrape our way into purgatory. Every Christian should be a hero. Heroes are not exceptions here. I don't think many realise that. They've got the idea that mediocrity is the norm. And sometimes, I think, even slightly below mediocre is enough. Well, that's not what St. John is saying. That's not what Christ says. He talks about perfection. Global tyranny is just around the corner, which surely must involve, because it always does, some form of religious persecution. And yet, people are still sleepwalking into, well, one mass once a week. Don't even have to get up early, it's not till 11. The wrath to come <laughs> is fast approaching. And people are still holding on to their petty grievances and their resentments and their dislikes and not speaking to people because they've got the ump. Look, on this third Sunday of Advent, we need to realise that the desert, the wasteland of our uselessness and sin, has been converted to green pastures through the fountain of living water which the grace of Christ has caused to spring up within us. We have the means to obtain our salvation. Let us cast away pusillanimity. And on Gaudete Sunday, let us rejoice indeed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.